Hello, I'm Dr. Matthew Connerman, and I'm a heart failure specialist at the University of Michigan Health. And I'm here today to discuss SGLT2 inhibitors and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with my dear friend, Sarah Aidy, PharmD from the University of Michigan Health. Hi, Matt. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. Let's get started. We are here to discuss a very hot topic in cardiology, SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or HEFPEF. We have known that SGLT2 inhibitors have a role in the treatment of heart failure, particularly heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as demonstrated in the DAPA-HF and EMPER reduced trials. Today, we are gonna focus on a review of evidence supporting the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in HEFPEF. We will also then transition to discussing common questions regarding the clinical use of SGLT2 inhibitors in HEFPEF. We know that SGLT2 inhibitors are beneficial in HEFPEF based on two large randomized trials that were published recently. In the dapagliflozin evaluation to improve the lives of patients with preserved ejection fraction, DELIVER trial, over 6,000 patients with heart failure and an ejection fraction greater than 40% were randomized to dapagliflozin versus placebo and followed for a median of 2.3 years. Less than half of the patients had type 2 diabetes. The composite endpoint of worsening heart failure or cardiovascular death was significantly reduced to 16.4% in the dapagliflozin arm compared to 19.5% in the placebo arm. This difference was driven by differences in worsening heart failure. The second trial was the empagliflozin outcome trial in patients with chronic heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the EMPER preserved trial. This study had very similar results. In almost 6,000 patients with heart failure and an EF greater than 40%, patients were randomized to empagliflozin or placebo and followed for 2.2 years. Again, SGLT2 inhibition with empagliflozin was associated with a significant reduction in the composite primary endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. The benefit was driven by a reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. Interestingly, there was no significant difference in total hospitalizations between the two groups, which does raise the importance of managing other comorbid conditions in HEFPEF given the rates of non-cardiovascular hospitalizations in that type of heart failure. Given the supportive data from these two trials, the 2022 AHA, ACC, HFSA guidelines support the use for SGLT2 inhibitors in HEFPEF with a class 2A recommendation. Similarly, the very recent 2023 ACC expert consensus pathway on HEFPEF management also gives a class 2A recommendation supporting SGLT2 inhibitor use. We know the evidence now that SGLT2 inhibitors are indicated in the treatment of heart failure with reserved ejection fraction. Sarah, what should be considered when starting an SGLT2 inhibitor? What dose do you use? What contraindications should you consider? Good questions, Matt. So in terms of patient selection, we know that SGLT2 inhibitors can be used in patients with HEF-PEF both with or without type 2 diabetes. These agents are contraindicated, however, in patients with type 1 diabetes or if they have prior diabetic ketoacidosis. A dose of 10 milligrams daily for both dipagliflozin and empagliflozin has been approved for the heart failure indication. Notably, there are differences in terms of EGFR cutoff for both agents compared to the FDA indication 
for patients with type 2 diabetes, as the heart failure trials actually included patients with an EGFR down to 20 for empagliflozin and 25 for dipagliflozin. Thinking about the impact on other guideline-directed medical therapy, SGLT2 inhibitors may impact potassium excretion. In a meta-analysis of clinical trials evaluating SGLT2s in those with heart failure, their use was shown to be associated with reduced discontinuation of mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. This may be important as it may allow for initiation of mineral corticoid receptor antagonists or angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors, which also have been shown to have some benefit in HEF-PEP. We also think of SGLT2 inhibitors having a slight impact on systolic blood pressure, perhaps by about three to five millimeters of mercury. And we should note to use caution in those with a systolic blood pressure less than 95 millimeters of mercury as they were excluded from the trials. Additionally, in terms of adverse effects, we think that there is, a, a, we know from the trials rather, there's associated risk of genourinary yeast infections and urinary tract infections. Any other thoughts on considerations for initiation of these agents, Matt? Sarah, I can't help but think about our goals when we round together on the heart failure service. We're always trying to optimize medications as best as we can before discharge. Importantly, the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors in clinical trials was seen within 30 days of initiation. So like other medications, we do try to get these medications on during the inpatient stay, especially given that these drugs are associated with a reduction in heart failure hospitalization. When starting an SGLT2 inhibitor, especially in the hospital, we do have to recognize that an increase in serum creatinine does sometimes occur with an average reduction of the EGFR of around 5%. Knowing this, it probably isn't the best thing to start an SGLT2 inhibitor in the setting of aggressive intravenous diuresis. Though that doesn't mean it can't be started with stabilization prior to discharge. Very, very importantly, the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors remains despite mild reductions in EGFR. And over time, SGLT2 inhibitors are protective for renal function. Therefore, we encourage providers not to discontinue therapy simply because of a mild increase in creatinine or decrease in EGFR. Sarah, how would we adjust medications for type 2 diabetes when starting an SGLT2 inhibitor? That's a great question. So we know that SGLT2 inhibitors only reduce hemoglobin A1C by about 0.5 to 1%. Um, however, if patients are well controlled um, with, in terms of their hemoglobin A1C, or if they have frequent hypoglycemia and they're on sulfonylureas or insulin, we want to wean or stop the sulfonylurea and then reduce the total daily insulin by about 20% in those patients. Additionally, we want to advise patients to monitor their blood glucose for three to four weeks, especially if we're making some of those changes. If patients are on other medications for their diabetes, the risk of hypoglycemia is very low. So generally we don't need to adjust any of those medications or dosages. In those with type two diabetes, if there is a procedure planned, especially if you're starting these agents during um, hospital admission, the SGLT2 should be held for at least three days. Matt, another common question that comes up quite a bit is, should diuretics be adjusted at the time of SGLT2 initiation? Sarah, that's a great question. And I think we're still learning uh, about the right answer to that question. We do know that in clinical trials, the loop diuretics that patients were receiving were not routinely adjusted upon SGLT2 inhibitor initiation. And in fact, SGLT2 inhibitors were not associated with higher rates of volume depletion in clinical trials. While routine adjustment of loop diuretics with SGLT2 initiation is not recommended, we do recommend that you assess volume status as you otherwise would. There are instances in which a patient may be mildly volume depleted and you may decide to decrease a loop diuretic at the time of 
SGLT2 initiation. Conversely, there could be instances where the patient is volume overloaded and you're certain that you don't want to reduce the loop diuretic at the time of SGLT2 inhibitor initiation. Most importantly, we recommend obtaining a basic metabolic panel to assess renal function and electrolytes within seven days of starting an SGLT2 inhibitor. We hope our discussion today will promote the appropriate use of SGLT2 inhibitors in HEF-PEF. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.